cloud. Okay, we are live and recording. So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you to joining the second cohort call for Open Life Science 3. This is the third round of Open Life Science that we're running. Um, so as always, I will start with a few quick housekeeping reminders. Uh, so first one is just try and keep your microphone on mute to prevent the background noise potentially coming through. Um, but again, if you wish to speak at any point, it's absolutely fine to unmute your microphone to speak up, to ask a question or to volunteer an opinion or anything like that. Uh, it is equally fine also to type messages in the chat or questions and we'll try and keep an eye on that and answer any questions or thoughts that come through there as well. Uh, so on the top left corner of the Zoom screen, you should see it says live on otter.ai. Click here to open live transcript. This just allows you to follow along. Um, it should try and transcribe what we're saying so you can follow by text rather than uh, by speech. Uh, that's completely optional. And let me see where we're at. We've got some fantastic icebreakers, uh, some moods about what's been going on with people who've been joining and how they've been finding OLS3. So exciting, busy, overwhelmed. Uh, I'm sending hugs. I, I feel the overwhelmed. There is, there is too much overwhelmedness right now. Um, I will have to go and look at the reaction gif you've put in here, how later on, uh, but Movika did indeed give a very winning 10 arguments against open science talk yesterday. That was absolutely amazing. Um, and yeah, just keep those icebreaker answers coming in and way too into this to be a side project. Loving it. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, this is fantastic. Um, I also see a, a couple of people saying that there are a lot of tools um, and yeah, absolutely. We do start with, I think, a bit of a hurricane of new and exciting things. I don't think we introduce much radically new after this. This is the first couple of cohort calls where it's like, here's all the things. Um, but if you ever have questions, please pop into the Slack or use email to your mentors or to the organizing team. And we will try and figure out what's up because we don't want things to be difficult. We don't want them to be scary. Um, and it, it, will, it will get more comfortable as, as we go. Um, right, we have a code of conduct. So as a general reminder, this means treat one another with the respect that you'd like to be treated with when we're interacting with one another in calls. Um, you can see this on page four. There's a link to the code of conduct. Um, if at any point you feel like you've either experienced or witnessed behavior that isn't in line with the code of conduct, then please report this. So you can report this to team at openlifesci.org. That's the group email that reaches myself, Malvika and Berenice. Or it's also possible to report individually if there's a reason that you'd rather not reach the whole team. Um, so all of our email addresses are over in the code of conduct section um, on page four. And I said page four, but I think I meant page five because the document moves and grows. Uh, so um, I think that the next, oh, one more thing, one more reminder is that we do breakout rooms uh, in, in the call and some, some breakout rooms can be spoken and other breakout rooms, these are just small private uh, rooms. Uh, these breakout rooms will be written, some of them. And so it's fine for you to either choose which one you prefer, but in order to make it easy for us to sort you into these rooms, um, we would ask that you just click on participants on the bottom of your screen. I'm using a computer, not a mobile here. There may be a way to do it on mobile as well, but click on participants and then click on your own name. And beside your name, there should be a more and it allows you to rename yourself and just put S if you prefer spoken for breakout rooms, W if you prefer written, or if you don't mind, just put SW and that allows us to sort you into each of those different types of rooms. So I'm just going to pause for a minute and just ask everyone to make sure that your name has an S or a W or both beside it now quickly. Um, and again, if there's anything that's unclear, now's the time to ask, some, ask questions. Looking good. Most of us have the F's and the W's. Um, fantastic. Right. Thanks, everyone. 
Um, so what's next? Oh, one last thing before we have introductions, uh, which is exciting. Uh, so, oh, I can see kitty cats. Um, I'm very easily distracted by kitty cats. So I apologize. Um, yeah, no, never sorry for cats. Uh, right, where was it? Oh yes, cohort name. Uh, so folks, we had, um, we've been voting on a cohort name in Slack, and I think it's pretty safe to say, based on all the votes, that the name for OLS3 as a cohort is going to be Perseverance. So, um, hello Perseverance! I am delighted to be working with you for the next few weeks, uh, months, etc. Okay, right. <laughs> Um, so from here on, we will introduce um, all of our emails and say hello, Perseverance as a cohort. Um, fantastic name. So thanks for suggesting it. I think John suggested it. Uh, next thing, introductions. Emmy, are you good to take us through introductions for anyone who is new this week? Yeah, um, hopefully. Uh, so can I can I just ask, sorry, because this is a huge cohort and it's always lovely, lovely to see all of you and have so many people here, but it also means that I lose track of who was here last week. If you just, if you haven't had the chance to join us last, uh, two weeks ago, um, put your name on the agenda um, so that we can know who you are and we'll go through um, the verbal introductions quickly as well. So because as you notice, there's quite a few of us. So uh, to do this quite efficiently, we ask you to introduce uh, your name, where you're based, um, your project name. So just the name, not a description and let us know your most recent hobby. Uh, so I'll just give folks about 10 seconds to put your name on the agenda. Uh, we're on, in the middle of page five, I believe. Um, and we'll go in the order on the agenda. Uh, I'll call just just waiting the five seconds <laughs> before. So um, again, my apologies for the horrible mispronunciation of names in advance. Please correct me. But Arvin Pritt, whenever you're ready. Um, can you please repeat your question? How um, saying? so just share your name, uh, where you're based, what's your project name, and your most recent hobby. Okay, uh, my project is on um, system genomic integration of diabetes related genes, a quest for development of biomarkers. Hey. This is the, the whole name of the project. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, do you have a recent uh, hobby that you picked up? <laughs> Something you, you're uh, you like currently doing? I'm busy in, in my exams as well. <laughs> Yes. So there's a lot of food in a project as well as you can. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, next we have Maxia. Yes. Hi everyone. I'm Marcia and I come from Italy. Uh, my project name is Seeding. Uh, I'm working with uh, Dario. Uh, um, and uh, my hobby are, oh, I love uh, gardening and I love uh, thriller books. So... <laughs> Fantastic. Great to have you here. Uh, next, we have John. Hi, my name is John. Um, I'm from Nigeria. I'm based in the UK. Uh, my project is uh, on a P1 variant, finding the global distribution. Uh, recently, I've been forced to learn how to code. That's what I'm doing now. Thank you. Nice to have you here. Hope the coding is going well. Um, Stephen? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Burgess. I'm currently in Champaign in Illinois in the US. Um, my project is called Open Phototroph. And I don't know, I've, I've recently been playing a lot of board games with my wife. So that's, that's my hobby. Great. There's quite a few board games fans here, I believe. So start a separate group. <laughs> um, next we have Ida. Hi, my name is Ida. I'm based in London. My project is about um, embedding open source or open science practices within a newly created team at the Alan Turing Institute in London. And my hobby is parenting because I have a 14 year old um, toddler. Great to have you here. Thank you. Uh, next we have Ali. 
Hey guys, uh, I'm Ali, I'm also from London. My project is I'm building a community health report on the Turing Way project. And my hobby, I don't know if it's a hobby, but I'm really into sports. So I really like watching football and basketball and stuff a lot these days while I can in lockdown, so yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Carlos. Hi, uh, my name is Carlos. I'm uh, based in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm not sure which project I should be talking about because I'm involved in a couple of projects. So uh, I just put question marks. And recent hobby is running. Uh, yeah, just running a lot more than I was running before. So yeah, thank you. Great to have you here. And next we have Hal. Hi, I'm Hao. Uh, I'm based in Gainesville, Florida in the United States. Uh, I don't have an OL, L, OLS project, uh, but I am working on an open grants repository. And my most recent hobby is to not water, overwater my house plants. <laughs> I share your struggle there. <laughs> Thanks, Hao. Um, I believe that's everyone in the agenda. Has anyone not had a chance to introduce themselves yet? You can let us know in the chat or quickly unmute yourself. Give everyone another five seconds. All right. Uh, ooh, name just coming in. Uh, sorry, Prakriti, do you want to give a short introduction of yourself? Hello, I'm Prakriti Garji. Uh, I'm based in Kathmandu, Nepal. And uh, our recent project for the OLS is um, uh, entitled um, Gyan Namuna, which is the model of knowledge. And my recent hobby is uh, reading books. And uh, yeah, uh, currently I have um, exams and so I'm preparing for it. That's it. All the best with the exam preparation and yeah, books recommendations are always recommended in Slack. <laughs> um, awesome, thank you all. Uh, so I th think the next section, we have a breakout room. Um, I think Malvika is not here yet, so I'm gonna try and do this. Um, so uh, might be your first breakout room, so I'll go through carefully. Um, and make sure we all manage to understand what's going to happen next. So in the next 10 minutes, um, we will divide you digitally and magically through the powers of Zoom into smaller rooms to discuss uh, two questions. So these questions are now put in the Zoom chat as well, but it's also on the agenda on the top of, oops, on the top of page six. Um, so think about a time you were collaborating or working on an open project and it was a complete train wreck. What has happened? What made it so chaotic? And think of another time, hopefully that was another time, <laughs> you were collaborating or working on an open project and everything was perfect. What has happened and what has made it sublime? So um, we'd like you to, in your groups, discuss these questions, um, share your thoughts and experiences so that we can all learn from each other. Um, as Yo was uh, saying at the beginning, we've all, uh, renamed ourselves with uh, S or for spoken breakout rooms or W for written breakout rooms. So um, in the written rooms, you could uh, write your thoughts down either using the Zoom chat or uh, we have also sections on the agenda in page six where you can just put your what you want to say directly on the agenda as well, whichever you prefer. Um, and in the spoken rooms, you can just speak. Um, and after this 10 minutes, uh, we'll come back and if we have some time, we'll, we, we can share sort of uh, what we've talked about in the smaller groups and you can also read other people's comments. Um, if you, when you're in the room, so in the moment, there will be a pop-up on your screen that you will be asked to click one button and you will enter the room. Um, if you need help within the breakout room, you don't know what's happening and you're confused, press the ask for help button that's on the bottom of your uh, Zoom menu bar. Is that kind of good? So are the, your other rooms ready? They are, and thank you for stepping in to introduce because I was just finishing the last bits in the rooms. Uh, so if everything is clear, can we have some thumbs up? 
Awesome. Okay, we have enough thumbs up that I'm confident. I'm going to send you all into the rooms and don't forget you have 10 minutes. Um, have fun. So, uh, Alexander and Nihan um, and Avinpreet, have you seen the pop-ups? Oh, okay, Avinpreet's gone. Make sure no one's alone. Vince, uh, but I wondered if anyone had anything really interesting uh, or surprising that you wanted to share from uh, the discussions that you had. And it's also okay to put this in chat or read out anything that's in chat as well. Um, or unmute, either is fine. I'm not afraid of leaving the awkward silences if necessary, uh, but what I will do, I will um, just, I'm going to scan through what we've been writing here. So we have some people saying it's really nice when someone takes uh, control of good housekeeping um, as one of the nice things. I can see people saying that when there's a lack of dialogue or a lack of trust that things don't go well um, or inattention to results uh, can be a problem. Having a leader within a team can be helpful. Expecting too much of collaborators. Ouch. Yeah, that can be tough. Uh, I wonder if the flip side of that is... Um, taking more on than you can do which I know is a problem I have <laughs> uh, definitely but try, try to make sure that when you promise to do something it's something you really can do that's a big tough one um, some 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 good things here I see brainstorming I see having at least one expert in the team some more negatives are uh, lack of leadership um, individual character intent on themselves that can be so tough yeah uh, Avin Pre, I know you, I know you mentioned unequal contributions. Um, that can be a challenge, but I think one thing to, to notice is that sometimes not everyone has enough time or ability to contribute equally. Uh, so I guess it's unequal contributions when they could, and there's good reason for them to be equal. Maybe makes a difference. Mismatched communication. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of ups and downs that are nice to think about when you just sort of read through the notes that everyone's been uh, fantastically adding to this Google Doc. Um, and maybe just things to think about in your own project, maybe to try and avoid or the good things that you want to be keeping on doing. Um, so everyone keep those notes coming in because they are absolutely beautiful. Um, and I love the way they make me think every single time. So I'm going to move on to the uh, next bit. So today, uh, since we sort of introduced GitHub in a bit of a scary way last time, um, we're going to talk about how one can use GitHub to um, to create a place where people can easily collaborate. And we're going to talk about a few files that you can put on your GitHub repository that just sort of, <laughs> I'm really sorry, Robin, I, I promise it will get easier. It, it, eventually, it feels like breathing. But anyway, um, some ways to make it easier for people to step into your project when they are joining and way, ways to make it, um, make them know how they can help you and how, how it's a safe space. So there's four files we're going to talk about today. The first one is the license. This just tells people how the content that you have can be reused. Uh, so what rights they have to share and distribute and reuse the things that you have. The second one will be the README. This is like the welcome mat that just tells everyone, hey, you're here. Here's what we're about. Um, then we also we have some contribution guidelines and we will have a code of conduct as well. So fantastically, we have some guest speakers who are very experienced at working on these things. And first up, we have Hao Yi, uh, who will speak a little bit about licenses and what open licenses mean. How are you ready? You are super ready. I'm going to mute. Over to you. All right. Hello. Uh, so hi, I'm here to talk to you very briefly about open licenses. Um, these slides that I'm sharing are uh, shared with a Creative Commons by license uh, developed by Open Life Science and then modified by me. 
I am not a lawyer. I only play one when playing board games. OK, uh, so a little bit about me. I am the reproducibility librarian at the Health Science Center Libraries at the University of Florida. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, uh, and my Twitter handle is how and why. Do feel free to reach out to me uh, if you have questions about research reproducibility or other related topics. Um, so the goal in talking about licensing in the context of open life science is, and open projects is we would like other people to be able to use Remix and share our the work that we're doing in our open projects. Um, and we achieve that by making sure that we have in our open projects explicit documentation about how other people can use and remix and share it. Um, and so we're going to go through uh, these slides um, and hopefully if there's time, uh, you know, have the ability to have a short discussion or answer any quick questions about this. Uh, with the goal being uh, that you will eventually know and understand the importance and how exactly to do the task of adding an open license to your work. Okay, and so going back to kind of the intent behind all of this, the open leadership framework talks about open leaders as designing and building projects uh, that empower others, right? We think about we're doing these projects because usually because we care about doing work that you know helps other people, whether those are people in our communities or outside our communities. Um, and so that's kind of where we think about one way in which um, you know, we do that interaction is by having our work be shared in a way that other people can, can use it. Uh, and so this falls in this box of, of the open leadership framework of building for sharing and making sure that we have explicitly in the building of our project a way that uh, we share the work. Okay, so some, some misconceptions uh, that I think I want to address when talking about licensing because uh, it is a it is a complex topic and it does relate to things like copyright and academic credit, uh, but licensing is not the same thing. Um, and so some brief uh, kind of points to make really quickly, uh, just because you share something on the internet or GitHub or someone else shares something on the internet or GitHub does not automatically allow other people to use it. Uh, if you are sharing work with a license, it does not by default give away your copyright. So you can share work with a free license and an open license like Creative Commons. That does not prevent you from publishing your work or selling your work or in other ways monetizing your work. And finally, uh, work that has been shared with an open license, you can use it and other people can use it. They don't have to uh, cite you necessarily. Uh, so it can be legal to use the work without citing you. Uh, but in an academic setting, if you are uh, doing academic research, that's still considered a violation of academic ethics. And that is something that you would pursue if it's a problem using academic means, um, because that can be uh, plagiarism. Okay, um, so some, some kind of common elements when we talk about licenses, there are of course many different ways um, you, can sh you can give other people permissions. Um, so many different example licenses um, and the kind of things that we think about uh, in terms of including in the open license are how people can use your work, how people can modify your work and how they can share your work and redistribute either the original or the modified work to other people. Um, and so, yeah. Some of these elements also include uh, attribution. So a lot of the open licenses that uh, are in use generally require that uh, if the work is being reshared by someone else, that the original authors are credited. Uh, so examples of this are the Creative Commons by license, uh, which has a, this attribution clause um, and almost all the other licenses that will be mentioned today. Uh, and 
one exception to this, one important exception to this is the Creative Commons Zero license, uh, which effectively is putting something into the public domain and waiving your copyright to, uh, to whatever it is that you are sharing using the CC Zero license. Uh, so some, some kind of advanced uh, complications uh, within this uh, topic of open license. Uh, so I put these as, I, I, I list these uh, as wrinkles because they are relevant to kind of consider, but maybe don't think too much about making sure you understand all the details of it. Uh, open licenses have this distinction between what we call copyleft and non-copyleft uh, licenses, uh, which basically have to do with whether uh, modifications of a work have to be shared under the same principles. Uh, the idea with the copyleft licenses, so uh, something like the new public license, the GPL, is that if someone writes a piece of software and shares it with that license, a company can't just build off of that software and then sell their modifications. They also have to distribute their modifications in the same license. And that way, it, it, it's a way of ensuring that kind of, if you're going to use something in the copyleft world, that you also contribute to that world. Uh, and this is not true uh, for licenses that are permissive, but not in the copyleft scheme. Um, and we generally prefer those in the kind of open licensing world. And I think for you know, open life science, uh, we don't necessarily want to be overly restrictive with how people can reuse our work. Uh, but that is, if that is something that is important to you, uh, that is something to consider. Uh, the next thing is that patents are also not related to copyright, uh, which are not are not the same thing as licensing. Uh, so copyright rights include the ability to copy, modify, and redistribute work. And patent rights include the ability to use, make, and sell work. Um, and so this generally tends to come up when we are talking about software in that open source licenses for software may or may not explicitly include uh, something that grants patent rights. Um, and this is a whole big can of worms. Uh, so I'll just say, if you are writing software and you have a plan to patent the software in any way, definitely talk to a lawyer uh, before thinking, before just slapping an open license and expecting that your patent rights will be preserved. Okay, that was a lot. Uh, so let's go into the, the kind of details of how you go about applying a license. Uh, so a license file um, is usually named uh, license in all caps, uh, and it goes in the, the root directory or the top uh, most folder of your project. Um, and you can definitely include multiple licenses. Uh, and that's important because you might have different components of your project that you want to apply different licenses to. Uh, and that's kind of important because licenses that are best for software are not ideal for content uh, like images or writing um, and in the reverse as well. And so there are ways that you can specify in the license section of your readme or the license file exactly which parts of your project uh, are associated with which license. Uh, so again, data and code and creative works are not the same thing. Uh, and so you may require different licenses. Uh, Here's an interesting tweet I saw earlier this week about this topic uh, that is relevant. And so ways that you can add a license to your project in GitHub, if you are creating a new repository in GitHub, there's a section at the bottom where you can initialize the repository uh, by clicking that checkbox, and then you can choose a, a license from among a number of built-in defaults to GitHub. So that's a way you can just start out a project with a license. But if you already have a project uh, in GitHub, there's another way you can add one of these license templates, uh, which is when you use the feature to add a new file, if you start typing the file name license in all caps, uh, a button pops up, which lets you choose a license template 
Uh, and that's also really handy to have in that, again, you don't have to go look for the full text of a license and get the file. Uh, if you're just working in GitHub, um, those are built-in defaults. Uh, some useful tools for exploring the different possible licenses you might want to use. Um, Creative Commons has a website that uh, goes through kind of the different Creative Commons licenses, including the CC0 public domain uh, license um, and the variants of the CC BY, uh, which include requirements, for instance, for attribution or uh, not letting people create derivatives of the work. Uh, software, again, is different. There are different licenses for software. Uh, so hopefully this table gives you a, a brief guide to some of these possible licenses. Um, and then the websites themselves have more detailed information uh, that are useful for you. Uh, again, more resources. Uh, if you would like to learn more about this very complex legal lease uh, topic in detail, but I will just sum up uh, this content in that you, if you're building an open project uh, and you want others to build off of your work and use it, you need a license. Uh, and that license is going to be this top level file whose name is license. Um, if you have code and data and different content in your project, you will want to use a different license uh, for those different types of uh, content. And then some good permissive defaults uh, if you're working with code uh, is to share a code using the MIT license. If you are sharing writing or documents or images, uh, the CC BY license, uh, or for data that you use the CC zero license, uh, which effectively puts it into public domain. So these slides are all linked to from the notes and that was a lot. I'm gonna go ahead and stop screen sharing and answer questions if we have time. Do we have time? I think we have time for just like one or two quick questions, but I know you need to hop off as well. Uh, so yeah, um, I think we have a question about the GitHub chooser and Creative Commons license from uh, Jennifer Miller that do, do they include um, Creative Commons or is it just software? a good question. Uh, let me test that out really quick. If anyone else has any other questions, uh, there we go, we've got more coming in. I think they only have CZ0. Yeah. I think you could still use the Creative Commons chooser and add it in, um, but it might be one that you can't use by default. Uh, yeah. We have another question here. How do you have a recommendation for licenses for educational resources? Uh, yeah, I use I use CC BY for all of my educational resources. Uh, if you go to Zenodo uh, and you look up my name, you will find uh, several several con lessons uh, and content that I share. Uh, I generally use CC BY for all of those because they're not they're not. I'm not sharing code generally. Okay, um, I think this will need to be the last question for now folks, but please do add more and we'll add them into the document and try and follow them up later. Uh, but Carla asks, why would you choose CC0 instead of CC BY for data? Great question. Great question, uh, really challenging to answer. Uh, there are, I think there's a legal gray area that has to do with whether you can actually copyright data. Uh, certainly you cannot copyright facts, um, like the sun is a star, you cannot copyright that. Uh, and there's a question of whether data is something that can be copyrighted in that there is artistic expression in the collection and measuring of data, but not necessarily in maybe the data itself. Uh, so that's, a can of weird legal stuff that I don't know how to deal with. Uh, but CC0 uh, is just kind of make sure that uh, the data can be used. Um, again, it doesn't cover academic credit. So if you want to have academic credit for the data, we recommend that you 
deposit it in a data repository where you have a DOI that can be cited academically and not to try and pursue attribution in a legal means through, for example, the CC BY license, which requires legally that anyone using it and resharing it provides that attribution. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Hal. I think in the name of time, although I suspect this could be a long Q&A session, in the name of time, we should probably move on uh, to the very next thing. Uh, Emmy, I think you're the host for this section. I'm going to drop off in a minute. So, Yep. Thanks, Jo. Uh, yeah, so on to our second document, uh, Read Me. We're very happy to have Carlos from the Netherlands eScience Center with us today. Carlos, whenever you're ready. Uh, hello. Okay, uh, so Amy, uh, I think you're quite close to Amsterdam science part, right? Yes, I am. I, I think that if you go to, uh, so there's a cycle path that goes from Amsterdam Science Park and, oh, and then you can cycle along the canal for a bit and then you go through waste, which is quite nice. And then you can cycle all the way to Busum. So we did this one last summer and it is qu actually quite nice because Busum is like a completely surrounded. It, it, it has like a moat around the whole city. Uh, so it's a very, very nice uh, cycle path and it's quite short. I think for you, it would be um, maybe under an hour, you should be there. Um, okay, now I'm hoping that everybody else is, who is this thinking? Who is this guy? Uh, what is he talking about? Why is he ignoring the rest of us? Uh, and what is he, what, what's the point of this talk? That was exactly my point. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm doing this in a presentation. Usually you start by saying, hi, uh, my name is Carlos Martinez. I work for the eScience Center and I'm going to be talking to you about readme files. That's the part of the presentation where you usually introduce yourself and tell people, this is what I'm going to be telling you in the next five to 10 minutes. Uh, so I deliberately asked Amy to help me to do completely the opposite to show a bad example of how you should not make a presentation uh, because it's the same thing that you have uh, with the readme file. So I'm going to be telling you about uh, readme files, uh, how readme files are useful to communicate about your project. Uh, so readme files are really like a the welcome, uh, the welcoming uh, part of your project. They're uh, the presentation card for your project, uh, where you would say, "Okay, this is my uh, introduction card. This is uh, my project. This is what my project is about. This is what my project does." And it should provide you all of the uh, initial information for your project. For what are you going to? Do, what this project is about? What the, I don't know. If it's a software project. Uh, what type of uh, software it is, which dependencies it uses, on which language it's written, what's the, uh, what problem it solves. So uh, these are all the things that you want to have in your readme file when, for introducing your uh, project. When somebody finds your project on GitHub uh, and they read your readme file, that's the first thing that they see, that's the first impression that they have about your project. And that's the, uh, basically that's the moment where people meet your project and that's a, a, either they like your project or they don't like your project. Either they will use your software or they will not use your software. But a readme is very important because it's that first moment that is that introduction to your project. It's, the, it's your project's landing page, it's your project's presentation card. So uh, that's why the readmes are uh, very important. Uh, usually readmes in GitHub, uh, you on software projects, you just have a file, which is a plain text file called readme with all capitals uh, or readme, uh, mark, you can use markdown on readmes as well. Um, and that's the, the first page that you will have on your GitHub repository. Um, so in your readme, what are the important things that you should have in your readme? It, you should say what, what your pr project is doing, uh, for whom uh, and why. So this is really the, the giving the context to your project. Um, 
is you should tell uh, what makes your project special, why uh, did you build this uh, new software library that does the same uh, that other libraries, what sets your, your specific software or your specific tool or your specific project apart from other projects that are already uh, out there and how to how to get started so if this is a software project how would you install this tool or how would you use it uh, or if it's a, a i don't know if it's a book uh, like the turing way how how you would get started contributing to this project or how would you get started using this project um, and you should, it's also also always a good idea to uh, point to useful resources about your project uh, so again, if it's a software uh, project and it's already distributed through um, package manager, where can you find the uh, links to you to the package manager that man manages your software? Or uh, if this is the, uh, the the readme for a project uh, and you have a website, maybe you also want to point to your website. Uh, so where are all the other resources uh, that are useful are and relevant for your project? Okay, um, so again, uh, in terms of uh, bad examples, good examples, if this was my software project and this is my readme file, this is a terrible readme file. Uh, so it has the name of my project and it tells you how, uh, how do I run my code and how to cite my paper. But it doesn't tell you what my software does, uh, why would you use it, in which context would you use it, uh, what problem does it solve? Um, how is it written? Where is the documentation? So there is absolutely no information about it. Maybe it's useful for me to remember how to run my code. Uh, but even for myself in three weeks time, I will forget what my project was about. And I will remember, was it the tool that I was using for this? No, I don't know. I don't remember anymore. So uh, I think this is the a best example I could think of of a terrible uh, readme file. Uh, maybe the, the only thing that could be worse is to not have a readme file at all. Uh, now, uh, a good example. This is uh, the, uh, the readme file from uh, the Turing way. Uh, this tells you what is the Turing way. Uh, it tells you that it's a lightly opinionated guide and it tells you that it's aimed for researchers. And I think, uh, yes, it also tells you where can you find the, uh, the guide and in, in a readable format and not in the uh, readme file format. Uh, so you can go to touringway.netlify.com. So it's telling you what it does, who it's aimed for, uh, points you to useful resources. Um, and one thing that I love is that it even points you to readme file in different languages. So that's uh, a really nice example of a readme file. Um, so um, yeah, so that, th those are the main things that you, that I think you should be uh, thinking thinking about when you write your uh, a readme file. Uh, so uh, reiterating what I've already said, it's the welcome message to your uh, website. You should share uh, all the uh, important information about your uh, project, what's your project um, mission, vision, what you want to do with this project. And it's also a good place where you can uh, link to relevant information, for example, licenses, code of conduct, um, which, as we just heard uh, from how it's uh, important to state your license uh, for uh, software projects and other types of projects. Um, Another thing that you, uh, I think it's important to consider is where your uh, software is going to, where your readme is going to be used. So if you write your readme on GitHub, and maybe this is a little bit, I'm, I'm switching to a very uh, software specific uh, example. Uh, but if, you're so, if you write a software tool and your software is on GitHub, uh, your users will look at your readme on GitHub. Uh, but they will also be able to see your readme in other places because once you connect your GitHub account with other places, your readme gets like harvested by uh, Docker Hub or by uh, PyPy um, and your readme ends up in other places as well. And maybe it also uh, your, uh, if you generate a, a website automatically from your GitHub repo, 
your readme ends up there as well so uh it's always useful to think how is your how are your readers going to read the readme so uh try to always uh consider who's going to read your readme file and in which context they're going to uh read it yeah so uh readme files context uh now, uh, what are my uh, uh, top tips for README? I think this is an exercise, I believe, that we want to do later. Uh, but um, basically, I think that uh, my take home message on README files uh, is that you should always uh, try to be clear and try to always think of uh, your reader, always think who's going to read it, uh, what information do they need, uh, what will they learn from this uh, readme file and uh, what do I want them to learn by uh, reading my readme file? So what is the information that I want to convey to them? Uh, so I think that's uh, all I wanted to uh, say about uh, readmes. Uh, trying to keep it, keep it uh, short. And I don't know if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Carlos, and thanks for the wonderful introduction. That got me completely confused as well. <laughs> um, folks, if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat. I think we can do maybe one or two in the interest of time, or on the chat is also completely okay and appreciated. Um, I'm just scanning the chat now. Uh, there is one from Mohammed. Uh, He's building a tool that outputs a report in HTML file. Can can we embed a sample report HTML uh, report .html in the readme? Um, can we embed? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I think if you're using GitHub, uh, you probably can link to uh, an existing report uh, on. Yeah, I think that would be the, the, the uh, I would do it that way. If you have a, a readme on your GitHub repo and you already have a report, I would probably link to it. Uh, yeah, yeah in the, rather than embed it in the readme itself. That's good, thank you. Um, and another one, uh, what can we put at the landing page of our website? Mission, vision, readme, question mark <laughs> that everything would you recommend putting uh, all the things like mission vision and you know the read, the bulk of readme or um so i would say um if this is useful for your reader um uh so i i okay so if you have like a, a long mission statement long vision statement uh for your project maybe either because you can end up with a readme that is extremely long and then it becomes unreadable and you you hit this wall of text and you don't want to read it um, but maybe if it's just like a one sentence then by all means put it in your readme but if you have like a rather long uh, mission vision statement documents i would maybe put them in a separate place and just point to them from my readme file uh, for people who are interested to, to reading those. Mm. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Carlos. Um, folks, if you have any other questions regarding your readmes, um, feel free to put them on the Slack after uh, the session as well. Um, happy to brainstorm together. On the note of long vision statements, um, we've given you sort of a pre-call exercise, I believe. Uh, that you may have time to go through, but basically there's this cool tool called Upgore 5. Um, and uh, you can try to use it now if you haven't had the chance before to uh, see if you can use it to modify your vision statement. So all you have to do is to go to the Upgore 5 website. Uh, let me put the link in the chat as well. Um, copy and paste your vision statement in there and then um, see what happens. <laughs> uh, and um, I will, well, uh, 
we'll ask you to do that in breakout rooms as well. So again, you'll be split into groups of three um, and you'll have seven minutes to try this exercise out and share with each other what you think. Again, you're in written and spoken rooms, so just be aware written rooms, please use the Zoom chat or the agenda to put down your thoughts. Um, hope that's clear, I'm opening all the rooms now. I hate it at the same time. <laughs> um, please do share your thoughts on the agenda. Um, curious to see how you find it. I don't think we'll have time to go through um, the comments in a lot of detail, though. So, um, please do put. I think all the rooms have been closed, so we're all back. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, I hope you found that interesting, useful, uh, insightful, surprising. Uh, please do share some of your thoughts or a four or five modified vision statements in the agenda. But meanwhile, we have a very in important topic to get to. So I'll hand it over to Malvika to talk about contributing guidelines and code concepts. Thanks, Amy. I'm just going to acknowledge that this is very difficult. It has been always difficult for me to do the Hemingway and Apogower to simplify my language. But honestly, if you go back to any open source project who are super successful, and if you try to read their vision and, and mission statement, they are very, very simple. And I think we want to achieve the simplicity. It doesn't mean you need to take away the essence that you have in your vision statement. If you feel that some words need to be there, this is just a suggestion. It's not a law. Nobody's going to sue you if you don't simplify it. So do as much as you're comfortable to do. With that, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to talk to you about code of conduct and contribution guideline. If you, if you come to open source, open science space, there are three documents that are essential to add to any project. One we heard earlier is about license. Choose a license add a readme so you're choosing a license so people know how to use your material you write readme so people know what it is about and if it's useful for me and the last one is contribution guideline and code of conduct so people can find your project and know how to use it people can find your project and know what it is about but the ultimate aim of any open source project is that allowing people to build upon it the innovation doesn't happen if there was nothing before us this is where the contribution guideline is very important. So people know that you're allowing them to use it, but in a what way. What we will do in my talk, I'll try to keep it concise, but uh, also in a way that you understand uh, the, the importance of involving people. So we will consider how to create a positive culture for contribution and collaboration in open projects. Give you a practical example of how a contributing.md file looks like, but it doesn't need to be called contributing.md if you're not using GitHub. It could be just contribution guideline and choosing a code of conduct. And please keep an eye on choosing. We are building on lots of open source projects, so we don't need to build everything from scratch. There's a lot of material references out there. Pick one that matches most your values. So yeah. Uh, just so you know, someone asked me if the cat cat picture is used. I think it has become our mascot. And that's why if you go to our Slack channel in random, we're just literally randomly talking about cats. Um, so I'm Malvika Sharan. I am the community manager of the Turing Way, which is the, the daytime job beside Open Life Science. Uh, that's not my Twitter, but I left it there because a lot of ideas that I'm going to talk about comes from Lily Winfrey, uh, and I totally, totally recommend you to follow her, Lil Scientista. Uh, you can follow me as well, but I'm, I'm always talking on Slack, so I don't think you need more noise from me. So what is a project culture? Um, when we want to build a project culture, we need to think about if we want to build a community. Is this a project that I'm creating just for myself or do I want people to come in and hang out with me? If I want people to hang out with me, how do I want this community to look like? How would, we, how would my members be? Are they gonna bring the same idea as me 
or are they going to be diverse that they bring different perspective they challenge me in building my project so i can achieve better than i can do alone these people are also who help you build and guide the culture right but as a project leader it's your responsibility to set the tone for how your community should look like therefore you need to make conscious decision when you're writing a readme page or when you're selecting a license and when you're creating contribution pathway for others when you're creating these culture you need to understand what your personal values that you're bringing in project are hence it becomes a project's value and how should people behave setting expectation is very important when someone enters a new space one of the biggest fear they encounter is not knowing anything they don't know what to expect they don't know how to behave they don't know what kind of behaviors are uh, accepted therefore it's important for you to let them know that this is what this project stands for and this is how you can contribute and there are a lot of unwritten rule which you want to get out of your brain and write it in a document so someone else can actually read it because no one can read your brain yet a project culture involves more than just setting a github repository or uh, telling people by email that hey come and join me there is a lot more to collaboration than that um, it's more than just a common goal or having different teams working on different parts or exchanging knowledge but also understand what actually creates those kind of values for example if you have to be intentional about the fact if you want a diverse team and therefore make an attempt to create a diverse team yourself things won't happen naturally you need to invest into it if you want to create an inclusive workspace you need to add a code of conduct you need to make sure that people are treating each other kindly therefore they want to be around each other and also when you open a conversation for discussion say that this is open for discussion and say that you're inviting them to be part of it so it's a language it's a set of norm people's expectation the tools that you use and how decisions are being made it's a project identity so how to build your culture um, two documents again clear contribution guideline and the code of conduct that is enforced coming back to what is community community in an ideal world is a set of different people who come together and live in an ecosystem that is nurturing for them. They don't have to be same opinion. They don't have to be same background. They don't have to be same expertise. People, people should be allowed to bring their, their skills and combine them in a way that their uh, outcome is a lot more powerful than the sum of their parts. And then what is contribution, right? Uh, if we just talk about GitHub, in GitHub, and again, next week we'll explore a lot more about GitHub. So if you're new to it, um, I will try to make sure that I don't use jargons. But in GitHub, you can go and write issues that a lot of you have created in OLS3. You've created an issue and you become actually a contributor of that repository. And this is a picture from the Turing way. You can see Sarah here, and that's me, and there are a lot of other folks. In the GitHub, you put it as a file, which is called contributing.md. And as I said, if you're not working on GitHub, you would still create a page that, that would be called contributing or contribution guideline. Why is it important? So you want to define what the structure of contributions look like, provide guideline how to make those contributions. You ensure that there is a consistency across your community. If people are working in different time zones, if they're not talking to each other, at least they have one place where they know how to find information. And when you write all these down, it actually improves your efficiency. You don't need to always repeat yourself and tell everyone over and over, over what, what all these guidelines stand for. And it also allows you to involve new people even if you don't know who they are at the moment, if they are able to find your repository, they have this guideline to guide them how to contribute to your project. And who's responsible for that? First of all, owners, uh, meaning people who are leading the project, they are responsible to create it. Contributors, which are all members, they are responsible to follow it. And consumers, like users and members, they can also de decide if they wanna share feedback with you. So this is a very, very good contribution guideline from the Carpentries. The Carpentries is another open source community uh, that teaches people how to teach computation. 
and it is a it is a wonderful page because it's it's just a community page that gives you links to all the places you can find information. So if you're lost, you want to come back to this page and you know, okay, I wanted to look at trainers or I wanted to look at champions. So you, you if you have this one page, which is called page of all links, that would be extremely useful for people to come back and orient yourself. But these are generally optional because when the projects are quite new, you don't really have a lot of files that you want to, you want people to read. You want to create a place for diverse community, right? And you would expect that everything is going fine and everyone's super happy. But what happens if something goes goes wrong? What if uh, things are not ideal anymore? You want to make sure that people have a place to feel welcome and protected. Therefore, you want to give them a code of conduct. Code of conduct is a set of rules. I'm sorry. Set of rule that outlines the social norms, rules, and responsibilities of an individual project, party, or organization. It's commonly abbreviated as COC. So generally, I would probably just randomly say COC, but that really stands for code of conduct. Do you really need a COC? Yes, you do need a COC. It invites people to your project. It sets clear expectation in your community and tells contributor that you care about your community. Often the misconception is that COC is a, a policy that is making people scared about the fact that uh, they will be, there will be consequences. But honestly, COC is setting tone for your community and making sure that people who would generally not become part of another community because they don't really know if they're welcome, it allows them to look at what are the guidelines. If someone harasses them, would there be any consequences or not? And they can make a choice based on your community culture if they want to become part of it. There are some examples and I'm gonna just quickly show you uh, CSV Conf, which is one of the newest code of conduct that they had developed last year. It's a conference. Uh, so they start with uh, what this code of conduct is, who does it apply on? And they also have two things, which is called enforcement and reporting. And I'll quickly go through that part as well. So here it is, right? They have code of conduct. Code of conduct is not just a box checking item, right? So it's not like, oh, I want to add all the documents that I would need to add, and therefore I need to add code of conduct without really reading it or meaning it. It's not enough. You need to add enforcement and reporting guideline. You need to make sure that people know how to uh, report, who the report is going to, and what, what will be the process for reports to be followed through. And often you would want to have anonymous reporting because you don't want to put pressure a lot on people. So getting started, uh, I would say that start by brainstorming core words that represent your community value. Consider behavior that you want to encourage. Think of the process for incidents and complaints and what are the consequences for those acting outside the norm. And understand and accept your role as project lead. So before we go, uh, at the end, you need to understand that open source has a lot of work uh, that is always thankless. People are doing a lot of work at the background. Therefore, you need to encourage and reward good practices. You can, if you are willing to, and if you have the capacity to designate a code of conduct uh, and safety committee, do so. Make sure that your code of conduct is quite visible and clear and communicate the process to contributors. Generally, as I said, don't try to create your own code of conduct. There are a lot of great examples of code of conduct that you can take and adapt for your community. So what are your contributing guideline and code of conduct tips? With that, I'll stop and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Malvika. Um, folks, if you have any questions for, oh, there's one already. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can you share an example of a good uh, COC? I believe we definitely can. Yes, so uh, we have linked to the Carpentries Code of Conduct. I am actually one of the chairs of Code of Conduct there, and we have spent years re revising that Code of Conduct. It is the best we can do. If you can adopt that and make it even better, it's great. If you don't want to do it, you can literally take the copy and use it. There is another version of that Code of Conduct from the Turing way, where we have simplified some reporting and enforcement guidelines. Um, so I think we can add both of those in the document for you to look at. But there are a lot simpler ones as well. You can look at open life science. Uh, we use uh, 
Covenant, I think, but there is another from To Do Group. So these are four or five that I'll add in the document um, for you to look at. Thank you. Um, yeah, folks, if you have any uh, other recommendations or good COCs you've came across, you can also add them in the agenda um, with links, please. Uh, Jennifer, do you have experience or recommendations regarding whether or not a COC should provide anonymous report of concerns? I do have opinions. I do think that people should provide name, but you need to make sure how you're protecting their identity. Because if you are taking a lot of anonymous reporting, there won't be anyone accountable for wrong reporting. And that would fall into the person who's handling the report. So make sure that you really ask for name, but at the same time, you say, say how you are keeping their identity confidential. However, if people are not comfortable, they're not going to contact you. Therefore, you can um, you need to decide for yourself if you're ready to handle anonymous reporting. We generally take anonymous reporting only at events because people are right there and the consequences as a result of reporting can be quite a disaster, I think. So, but we don't take anonymous reporting for communities when we are working online because we need to know who is it, what really happened. And uh, if there's nobody accountable for that, there's really little we can do. Thank you. Uh, I think we're one minute away from uh, 30 minutes past, so maybe it's good to round up for now. Thank you. Thank you for Yeah, I will, I will stick around after the call because generally uh, people stay on for these kind of conversation off record. So we'll stop recording after one or two minutes. And if you want to stick around, I'm here. Amy, please go ahead and close it. Okay, I'm going to close the call. There is a list of assignments, I believe, on the agenda. I don't know if we need to. Uh, yeah, so um, create a GitHub repository for your report if you uh, are familiar with GitHub already. If you're not, don't worry. Next week, there will be a skill up call for uh, all of us who are just starting on GitHub, myself included. Um, so that will be Wednesday uh, at 1.30 CET PM. Um, uh, but the information is on the calendar as usual. Um, please add a link to your GitHub repository when you have one to your issue that you should have posted uh, last week, I believe. Um, and use your canvas to start writing a readme file uh, if you can. Um, and add a license, add a code of conduct, lots of stuff. Um, so have a go at this. And if you have any questions while doing this, please do. Uh, ask in Slack or check with your mentor as well, who may be able to help you with things. Thank you all for joining us today. Very happy to see you all. Um, and I will stop the recording at this point. Have a good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are, and see you in two weeks. I just want to add, we could stop recording.